All right, let's go to Isaiah 59 as we look again at this uh, wonderful promises in Isaiah 59. The context is that, as usual, Israel was sinful and helpless. Chapter 59, verse 2 says, Your iniquities have separated you from God. Verse 3 says, Your hands are defiled with blood. Verse 4, Lawsuits are brought unjustly. Verse 7, Their feet run to evil. They're swift to shed innocent blood. Verse 10, they grope for a wall like the blind. They don't know what to lean on. They stumble. And verse 16, there's no one to help. Uh, interesting statement, God wondered at this. No one, no man to intercede, to intervene on their behalf. They run out of options. But God, he says, his own arm, verse 16, he's going to, his own arm brought him salvation. His righteousness upheld him. And he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation. Uh, he's going, verse 18, he's going to repay his adversaries. So they fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rising of the sun. So then it's, most of the translations have, and He will come like a rushing, like a flood. He, uh, King James Version takes as the enemy. He's going to, uh, when this condition prevails, when there's a, when the enemy of the adversary and the destruction is like, a flood, a rushing torrent. You see, it, the word means a narrow gorge where the water, where a large rainfall has just caused this rushing stream, like a torrent to sweep all before it through this narrow gorge. When he comes in like that, like a rushing stream, then the wind, the ruach, the Hebrew word ruach means it can be either wind or spirit. It's the, it's the same Hebrew word, wind or spirit. Here, the wind or the spirit of the Lord is going to drive it away. It's going to arrest it. Stop it in its tracks. King James Version says it's going to, he'll raise a standard against it. The idea seems to be this. When he, the enemy, suddenly, like a surprising flash flood, comes in, threatening everything in its wake, then God will blow upon it. He will move by his spirit with a corresponding power. It's like when the enemy gets forceful, the Redeemer is more so. Like Paul said in Romans 5.20, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So you have a paraphrase, I'll give you the paraphrase of it, the Amplified. When the enemy comes in like a rushing torrent, like floodwaters that threaten to sweep us away, the Spirit of the Lord will blow upon those fearful waters, and He will intervene and save us. An illustration is in Genesis 7 and 8, where the floodwaters rose. And every living thing on the face of the ground, animals, birds, insects, perished. And the waters through the flood prevailed. For 150 days, Noah was in the ark. 
After 150 days, you know, you begin, the supplies are low. And you're wondering, how long is this ark going to hold up? And nerves are frayed. But then it says this, Genesis 8, 1. Then God made a wind, ruach, a sp the spirit, blow over the waters, over the earth, and the waters receded. That's exactly what this is saying. When, in, when judgment, when flood waters come in threatening to engulf you, then God sends the Spirit to put a stop to it. He knows how to save us. You also see it in Exodus 14. We find Moses had brought Israel out of bondage. And they had come, on, on each side were great mountains. Behind them was the pursuing Egyptian army. And ahead of them was the Red Sea. So their progress is stopped by the waters. Their escape has been closed. But then notice how, how he puts it. Exodus 14, 21. Moses stretched his hand out over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back. You see, he drove it back. That's, what, that's the, exactly what he's saying here. It may even be a reference to the Exodus. By a strong east wind, wind, ruach. So the sea made became dry land, and the waters divided, and the people went over on dry ground. So, this is the message of Isaiah 59, 19. The Spirit of the Lord will come and move on your behalf. This is true, I think, nationally in our nation. I think it's true... Uh, in our marriages. I think it's true in our health. I think it's true in our finances. When I was pastoring in Texas, uh, we were just a young family with uh, small children and uh, Jen was pregnant with a th our third and she had to go into the hospital. The baby was born with muscle disease of some sort. And so she stayed in the hospital for months in, in emergency care. And uh, we had no insurance. And it, and the, you know, man, the, 30, over 30 years ago, we ended up with no insurance, owing the hospitals and the doctors and the bills kept coming over $100,000. <laughs> I mean, you're kidding. I think I was making 400 a week. And then all my expenses had to come out of that. So then we got a call to come to Michigan. I'm like, honey, let's get out of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> One guy said to me when we got here, he said, Why, why'd you come to Flint, Michigan? You must be in trouble. <laughs> no, 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 I'm good. But I remember thinking, you know what? That hospital in Texas, they don't know where I'm at. I'll just let that lie. But God got to talking to me. And you know... Uh, David ran toward Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. When you got a Goliath, you don't, you don't wait for him to come. You go toward him because God is with you. And God dealt with me. In fact, I remember the night I was watching the NBA finals. And my heart was so heavy. 
to call those people that I had to leave the NBA Finals. Now that's how you know when God's dealing with you. You walk out the door, and you don't know who won. I still don't know who won. But I walked out the door, and I walked around the house, and it was getting dark. I said, Jesus, if I have to be poor the rest of my life, I will obey you. And I called them the next day. I said, I think I owe you $100,000. Not going not gonna to lie to you. I'm not going to write you a check. <laughs> but I can send you $100 a month. And they said, all right. About six months later, I got a letter in the mail. And it said, I kept that letter for a long time. Uh, and somewhere in uh, uh, moving in jostling of my libraries lost it but I can remember what it said we are glad to let you know an anonymous donor has paid your bill in full I, I still don't know who did it if it was one of you all would you please let me know after church today but I know what happened. I was about to be engulfed. Folks, I was so poor. The only cars I got was what Jan's parents gave me. And <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't go to the Dairy Queen and get an ice cream. But, so I was getting engulfed. But the Spirit of the Lord blew upon those waters and they parted, and I walked across on dry ground. That was my exodus. And I've prospered ever since. Got to be honest with you. I'm not a poor preacher. I ain't no rich one. So don't be asking for money. <laughs> when there's... When there's sin and helplessness and no man to intercede, he puts on his armor, he puts on his breastplate, and he rides forth, and he blows on those waters, and he says, Step back, I'm here to rescue my child. When does this happen? When was the great event of this? Look at verse 20. And a Redeemer will come to Zion. Keeping up this theme. A Redeemer will come to Zion. Now Zion, Isaiah 52, 1. Put on your beautiful garments, O Zion, O Jerusalem, the holy city. Zion was Jerusalem. When did the Redeemer come to Jerusalem? When Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And he grew up within walking distance of Jerusalem. And he entered into Jerusalem itself. The Redeemer had come to Zion. So this actually began in its fullness when Jesus came. He is the one who puts on his righteousness as a breastplate, verse 17. His own arm brings salvation and he rescues his people. And then... Who does he come to rescue? Upon whom do, does the Spirit blow? Look at verse 20. He names three groups here in verse 20. He comes for these people. Those in Jacob who turn from transgression. That's one. You've got to let some things go. Second, verse 21, As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, and I think that's the new covenant. My spirit that is on you, my words I put in your mouth, will not depart from your mouth or the mouth of your children. It's not only for you, it's for your children. And then look at, Or out of the mouth of your children's children. 
grandchildren. I got 15 of them. <laughs> Anybody got more than that? More than 15 grandchildren? Well, who? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, not yet. That's faith. I like it. Well, I can say the same. Not yet for me either. No, I don't know about that. Bud, where are you? Let's get busy. <laughs> but this is a promise. Now, now get the context here. This is a promise that Jesus will come and by the power of His Spirit will rescue those who turn from transgression in Jacob, their children, and their grandchildren. And we ought to pray that and believe God for that and insist on it. Say, Lord, this is your promise. You're my Redeemer. In, in Acts eleven fourteen, there's a man named Cornelius. God said, Cornelius, I want you to send a message to Peter, the apostle. And by that message, you will be saved in all of your household. In Acts 16, there's a woman named Lydia. And, and she lived in Philippi. And Acts 16, 15 says, after she was baptized... And all of her household. The Philippian jailer, Acts 16 31, the earthquake came and opened up the doors of the prison cells. And the jailer knelt before Paul and said, What must I do to be saved? And Paul said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. In Acts 18.8, 8, there's a man named Crispus. Sounds like a cereal, don't it? But it says, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. Look, just look at these verses. It's Noah and his household. It's Abraham and his household. It's Cornelius and Lydia and the Philippian jailer and Crispus, the synagogue leader, and their households. Let's bring our households into the kingdom of God. It is part of the promises of the Redeemer and His covenant for us. Praise God. John wrote in first, or second John, he said, I have no greater joy and to hear that my children are walking in truth. Hallelujah. And then what are the marks of this? How will we know for sure? What are the two things that stand out? This is in verse 21. This is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is on you, that's one thing. My spirit that is on you. And literally it reads, my spirit that will not leave you. My spirit will not leave you. The permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit who will never leave you or forsake you or abandon you. When you fail, He works with you. When you sin, He convicts you. When you are confused, He will guide you. He does not leave you. That's the promise here. That's the mark. The mark of a Christian is not that he doesn't sin. The mark of the Christian is that the Holy Spirit won't leave him alone in it. The second mark is my words that I have put in your mouth. The words of God. Here you have that combination, the Spirit and the Word. The Spirit and the Word. Those two go together. The Spirit without the Word tends to fanaticism. The Word without the Spirit tends to legalism. But the Spirit and the Word 
is a Christian. So this is how he puts it. I'm encouraged this morning because I have seen the Lord Jesus rescue me, rescue my loved ones, rescue people in our church from some awful situations. See, I know some things. It's all right. They're safe. They'll go to my grave. Y'all happy about that? (laughs) You should be. Some of you should be saying, Hallelujah. God rescues us. He rescues marriages. There was a time in my marriage when I said, you know what? We we were in the bedroom and uh, it was downstairs and Jan was upstairs. And I said, I just don't think I want to do this anymore. I'm tired of her attitude. I thought she had a mouth on her. And so I went to bed and locked the door. And I was laying there thinking, she can just sleep on the couch tonight. I'm not going to sleep on the couch. It's my bed. I'm going to sleep in the bed and she can sleep on the couch. Now you have to understand, this was months ago. (laughs) <laughs> this ain't recent. I was laying there in the bed, and the Holy Spirit come. Oh, man. And here's what he said. He said to me, as clear as daylight, he said, Do you want me to do to you what you just did to her that is lock the door so you can't come in. And I said, no, because I need to come into your presence. Then he said, then you get up and unlock that door. I said, yes, sir. And I unlocked the door. Not long afterwards, she came down, went right to sleep, knew nothing about this huge battle that had just taken place in my own heart. She just went right to sleep. I thought, that is not fair. (laughs) There. Because I still meant, but I obeyed God. Now, there were times I didn't. And it was, but he he never leaves you alone. His word is in your mouth. Those are the marks of the believer. But he can help us financially. He can rescue us maritally, emotionally, personally. And let me just say one other thing too. Um, In light of the events of this week, God can help our nation when it seems like there's no hope. He can rescue us Nationally, in 1812, a war broke out between the United States and Great Britain, just as it had in 1776. England was also fighting France and Napoleon at the same time, but they had defeated Napoleon, and so all the English soldiers were then freed up to come over to the States and fight the the United States. It seemed like they were winning. In fact, you don't hear much about it, but they almost did win. They had captured a thousand American vessels, and their armies were advancing on New York and actually entered Washington, D.C. They took Washington, D.C., entered the Capitol and the White House, and decided, they sat in the chairs of the congressmen and mockingly had a vote, should we burn the city down? And they all voted yes. So they went out to burn down the White House and the, whole, and the key buildings of the city. 
in their progress and celebration, thunderclouds rose. This, this, by the way, is called the tornado that saved America. Thunderclouds rose. Amazingly, a tornado in Washington, D.C. Who ever heard of that? Huge tornado came through Washington. It seemed to aim for the British. The walls of the buildings fell on the soldiers. Their cannons were lifted up and tossed in the air. They would later descriptions was that horses and riders were picked up and thrown down. More British soldiers died from the tornado than by the American troops that were sent to defend the city. One British general asked a fleeing woman, he said, what is this weather? Do you have tornadoes in Washington? And she said, we do for God's enemies. And along with the wind were the rains which put out the fire. Now, the rest of the story is this. President James Madison, known as the chief architect of our Constitution, called forth at the beginning of the war a day of prayer and fasting. This was renewed on, in 1813. And here's what he said. He called the nation to prayer and fasting. He said, let us seek God. Let us acknowledge our sins and let us ask God for His mercy. Boy, we need a president like that today. Let us seek God. Let us acknowledge our sins. Let us ask for mercy. God rescues nations. So we sum up verse 19 like this. When the enemy comes in like a rushing torrent whether personally, nationally, maritally. When the enemy's like floodwaters that sw threaten to sweep us away. Oh, the Spirit of the Lord will blow on those fearful waters and He will save us from an awful destruction. That's my prayer for everyone here today. Every one of you. Whether you're in one now, whether the waters threaten you now, or whether they do it in the future, here's a promise. The Redeemer has come to Zion. He sent forth the Holy Spirit, and He will blow upon those enemies. He will blow upon those flood waters that threaten to engulf you, and He will rescue you one way or another. That is our God. That is our Redeemer. And He has come to Zion. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. And ushers, you come. Let our worship to God today not only be praying and singing, hearing His Word, but in giving and laying our tithes and offerings at His feet. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you today for your promises to us and our children and our grandchildren. What a wonderful vision of the future when you are in charge. May you be glorified in our lives now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.